What is it that small businesses need to be weighing up? Because you raised an issue this last week, which I think is really important about WageKeeper not necessarily being good for all businesses. Why? Well, because uh, employees are still accruing uh, their entitlements, and good on them. You know, we're certainly not saying don't pay your entitlements. You have to pay entitlements. Uh, they're still accruing them. So some businesses have stayed open to look after their employees. They've said, OK, I'll, I'd normally close, but I will stay open uh, until September because that helps my employees. They get more money, uh, and then I'll close, and hopefully I can open again in the future. But they're still accruing um, rec leave, for example. So if you've got 10 staff and they've been on um, JobKeeper for, te for the whole six months, you would have accrued on average $40,000 worth of entitlement debt. So you have to pay that money. So wow. businesses need to look at what they've got. Yeah, they've got to look at, do I have that money? Where do I get it from? Because the, the real another issue for the economy is those businesses that do close, and there'll be plenty, we want them to be able to reopen. They're closing not because they're bad business people in the main, but they're closing because of a virus. So but we want them to close in a way that keeps their house safe and they can open again sometime. Yeah, so what you're saying is that, I mean, if, if you have a small business which is really in a bad way and there's a good chance may not make it, and then you've got these extra commitments, uh, you're, you're literally in a situation where you could... Be, I mean, you could end up as a business owner uh, losing perhaps your own house uh, as well as the people that you employ losing their jobs. So it's quite a difficult thing to weigh up. Uh, it's very difficult. And as I say, thankfully, it's not every, nowhere near all the businesses on JobKeeper, but it's a significant number. The OECD predicted at least 200,000 businesses would close in Australia. A lot of them will be sole traders. It's not good for them. There's no impact upon the, the workers. So, yes, we've got to, we've got to talk to... to um, and we're talking to the government now about a thing called assistance to, to, to businesses going through change. So there's some that will close. Let's, let's help them close in a really coherent way. Let's get a voucher for them to go back to their accountant or their bookkeeper or whoever and say, give me a hand here. It might be a few thousand dollars. Help me close and keep my mental health and keep my house and keep my family and then I can put my, you know, my life back together, my business life back together and reopen again. You're going to have all these businesses, as you know, Tiki, that are, are going to be able to stay open if they can restructure and get things in a, different, in a different way. So they might have 10 staff, they might be able to restructure and employ five. They're going to need a hand, not all of them, the great majority of them will need a hand to rewrite their business plan, to restructure and to change. And then you're going to have others that can grow and they're going to need a different sort of support. Peter, just on the government's free childcare provisions, um, of course, these have indirectly benefited many businesses, but they're due to end at the end of this month, so surely that's, that's too soon for the government to backtrack. So what impact is this change going to have on business? Well, it's going to have an impact upon individuals, without a doubt. So, and and it's double, the, the double impact is with the lockdowns, of course. So how does this all work in with people that are going to have to go back home and do homeschooling or not? Uh, impacts upon different businesses in a different way. And one of the things we've been looking at, and we need to get better at this with, with the governments, is articulating the impacts upon different businesses uh, and, and what we can do about that. So we've learned through, you know, the, it was a great response from government. We all know that, but they've learned a lot of things now. Let's articulate those learnings so that we can tell businesses out there and the business associations can get to their members and say, right, this is what's happening. This is the good and the bad and the ugly of it, and this is what we recommend. So let's get more information out to the business community. I know, Peter, that we've discussed a few times in the past that, that you'd like the government to, to stall or stop the, uh, the increase in the superannuation guarantee, but are there any other policy areas that you'd like to see the government embrace, perhaps when the Treasurer stands up next week and delivers his update? Well, obviously, workplace relations, that, that is being dealt with through those groups at the moment. I'm on one of them. That my council's on three of them. So let's see how that goes. But that has to change. If we're going to grow our manufacturing sector, one of the big impediments is workplace relations. The other one's competition policy. It's something that's coming up now is we, uh, we've had a lot of laissez-faire economics in the past. And as we know, we've got this huge reliance upon China as a result of it. So we're not asking for protectionism or any of those sorts of things, but we're asking that the market can compete and can compete in a, in a pandemic world. So that means competition policy needs to start considering the health of a community. Like, is it good to have uh, lots of shops in suburbs around Australia so people aren't all going to the big mall 
which is a place where you spread disease, but they're going, as we know, they're going to the butchers and the pharmacists and the little supermarkets around the nation, and that's been a much healthier thing. So let's look at competition policy and make sure supply chain management and the health of the nation is considered in competition. That's very. That's a very interesting line for you to lobby on, Peter, I must say. Um, look, um, Victoria clearly is in trouble at the moment. We've now got compulsory masks yeah. as of, I think, midnight Wednesday. So um, the government until now has been sort of dealing with this nationally. Do you think that's going to change at all when it comes to Thursday, and should it? Um, I think it should, they should have come up with the, the national policy, but we've learned that you apply it where you need to apply it in the best way. So, as you say, with Victoria, New South Wales, who knows what's going to happen there? You've got West Australia, which is quite open, and businesses are operating very well over there. So I think for the sake of the budget, but also the sake of business, is that we need to have a national policy that you modify for the particular situation. I think, Tiki, you know, I've been talking for years about local economic empowerment or empowerment of local business communities, because they're the ones, you know, who want to grow. They're the ones who know where the problems yeah. are and so, they're so the ones that are going to take a government policy and make so it this work. Hint, this hinting from Matthias Cormann uh, this morning on, on some sort of tax, uh, tax incentive, investment incentives to kick things along, that would have been welcome news to you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's what we need to do is those sorts of incentives now. We don't go and give grants to businesses. There will be some that give a, get a grant to, to start up manufacturing or whatever. But you help businesses by removing tax, by uh, helping them find workers, by paying workers to move from one uh, location to another where the jobs are. There's lots of things we did in the last recession which worked very well, and we're going to do them again. We just yeah. have to get a few laissez-faire economists to listen.